let's talk about elephants. Not the ones at the zoo, the kind in the room. The term elephant in the room means an obvious problem that no one wants to discuss. Elephants can show up for a variety of different reasons, including but not limited to mental illness, trauma, and abuse. Maybe you'll see it and say, hey, there's an elephant. Maybe you won't. Maybe you don't even know it's there because other people in the room have gone to such great lengths to cover him up. Elephants feed on the very things you don't want them to have. Fear, guilt, and shame. The more you try to will that elephant away, or drink that elephant away, or cut that elephant away, the stronger it gets and the more control it has. Before you know it, you wake up to find this elephant sitting on your chest, taking up so much room that you're lucky to get past him just to get out of bed. I'm here to let you know that there is hope for your elephant. Think of him like an untrained dog. If you get a puppy and provide it no training, you will end up with a monster that eats your shoes. But when you work together, you develop a relationship. And just like you would take your dog to obedience class, there are people who can help you learn to work with your elephant. Therapists, psychologists, and psychiatrists are all experts in the art of elephant training. Now, every elephant is different. I have bipolar disorder, so my elephant needs a daily dose of medicine and at least eight hours of quality sleep every night. My elephant affects my memory, so I have had to learn to write everything down. And the only reason I can stand here instead of there is I have been rehearsing these words every single night for the last six months. <laughs> Thank you. I have also learned that I can't put too much on my plate. <sighs> See, memory stuff, right? <laughs> I can't put too much on my plate, and I have had to turn down some amazing opportunities because the timing just wasn't right for my elephant. But the timing is right for me now to talk about it. I suffered alone and in silence for over 20 years. We didn't talk about mental illness in my house. Schizophrenia was something that my mom had and took care of on her own. I was 13 when I learned about it. To put this into perspective, the year was 1996. The internet made sound while you connected to it. 1996 was before Google, before WebMD, and before we had the internet at home. So my options for researching mental illness would have been whatever was in the middle school library. I didn't know that talking to a guidance counselor was an option because I thought that only problem kids could go to that, club, to that office. I was 14 the first time I witnessed my mom get sick. I asked her what it was like, and she said, you know that song, I can see clearly now the rain is gone? It's like that. Everything is dark and rainy, and then one day you wake up and the sun will be shining again. And I hoped that I never knew what that would be like. Around this time, I was told that someday I would become crazy like my mother. Hello, elephant. <laughs> I became terrified that if any of my friends or classmates found out about what was going on at home, that nobody would talk to me. So I did a preemptive strike and I built these big walls to keep everyone away. I didn't really date. I had a few close friends, so I always had things to do and places to go. But I felt like that peripheral friend because I couldn't get too close. 
when I went away to college, my elephant came too. Maybe it was being away from home for the first time, or breaking up with my first boyfriend, or watching my friendship with my best friend since seventh grade fall apart as our attempt to be college roommates ended in separate dorm rooms before the end of the first semester. My best friend moved out, and mania became my new roommate. I was up until 3 or 4 o'clock every single morning, and I was still ready to go for my 8 a.m. classes. And nobody wanted to stay up and watch the sunrise with me on the weekends. And then it was like a switch flipped. The mania was gone, and depression took its place. I could barely get out of bed. I would get up just long enough to go to class and then sleep the rest of the day. And with everything going on, I still I couldn't connect the pieces. I remember walking by the counseling center on campus, feeling like maybe I should go in there. But I thought, how can they help me when I don't even know what's wrong? I never went in. Instead, I ran from my elephant. Because when someone tells you that you are going to end up crazy, you believe them. And so I also believe that if I could stay away from any mental health care offices, and if I could not get that label of a diagnosis, that could prove that I was fine. A few years after college, my mom was having some medical issues, and I called her psychiatrist out of desperation. He told me that he had diagnosed her with schizophrenia in the 70s because you have to have a diagnosis in order to bill insurance. Then he told me that if he could re-diagnose her with today's criteria, she would have bipolar disorder. And I did not know what to make of that information, so I thanked him for his time and hung up the phone. In 2017, I opened this show, Singing Brave by Sarah Bareilles. Then I sat on this stage and listened to three brave women and their loved ones share their experiences with bipolar disorder. Our wonderful producer, Erin, explained how she found out she had bipolar disorder in the middle of her psychiatric nursing class as they went through a bipolar symptom checklist. And she even went through that checklist here on stage. To jump around a little, this is the point in my story where I was telling all of this to my psychiatrist at my very first appointment. He stopped me and said, so is that when you knew that you had bipolar disorder? And I said, no, I still had no idea. <laughs> but being in this show, gave me courage. It was the courage I needed to want to know more about my elephant. So I called my therapist and made an appointment. She suggested that we look at bipolar disorder due to my family history, because by that point, my uncle had also been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And I told her, fine, but I don't have that. So she went to her bookshelf and took down the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, and she opened to bipolar disorder. We skipped over the depression symptoms because by that point I knew I had been through at least three or four major depressive episodes, so we started with mania. And she said, mania is a euphoric, elevated mood. And I said, aha, I don't have that. <laughs> I have never had that. And what I would give to feel good like that just for one day. But she wasn't done. Then she said, mania can also be irritability that's noticeable by others. And my jaw just about hit the floor. <laughs> because often the only way I know there's something going on is when my husband starts asking, are you mad at me? 
did I do something wrong? To which I will reply, I'm not mad at you. Why would you think that? Thank you for putting up with me, by the way. <laughs> so I am so happy and proud to report that I finally have the tools I need to work with my elephant. And this fella is here to stay. I can't just drop him off at the bus station with a one-way ticket. So instead, I tattooed him on my shoulder <laughs> as a permanent reminder that my work with him will never stop. And he's a message that we all have elephants. But amazing things can happen if you can find the courage to bring your elephant out into the sunlight instead of keeping him locked away. I thought that the bravest thing I could do today would be to tell you about my elephant. Because the bravest thing you can do is talk. Thank you. <laughs>